rest of these things. Corporate, then work law, trade law, security, education, health, nutrition, resources, benevolence, and by benevolence we mean supporting, caring, charity, and then criminal. Now it may seem like there's more than 22 there, but they in fact the 22 books of canon law. And I'll just whip through them once more so that you've got them, and then we'll go into cognitive law. So the, the order of them are, or proposed is, divine law, natural law, cognitive law, positive law, ecclesiastical law, administrative law, urban law, civil law, monetary law, financial law, technology law, corporate law, work law, trade law, security law, education law, health law, nutrition law, resources law, benevolence law, international law, and criminal law. Now, in that 22-book structure, I am confident saying now, albeit it is not there, and the good news is, for most of these areas at the back end, there's already been codes developed, so it's a matter of distilling and extracting the essential maxims of those, which the good news means that these 22 books of canon law will be able to be finished once we break the front end of this and get through. So it will be able to be done in, in, in weeks and months, and it certainly won't be taking years. I am confident in saying that this structure, when completed, providing it has the input and is given the appropriate testing and discernment by you and those you know to question and test everything, to ensure that it is absolutely rock solid, I am confident that it will be what it needs to be as the principal resource of learning, of citation, of reference, and argument as we move forward in conquering the peril and the tools of fear, threat, duress, danger that the present system presents to us. Okay. Let's talk about cognitive law because I introduced a definition at the start and it may have sounded a little bit odd in this straddling between divine and natural and I use the word supernatural because it is part divine and part natural that cognitive being another way of saying the laws of the mind. <clears throat> but I want to go into it now because I feel that this is a really important section uh, when we talk about um, how cognitive law will play a crucial part in our learning, in our strength, in our citation, in our reference, and in our argument. So let me just run through a couple of things to, to give some more flesh to cognitive law. So when we say cognitive law, we're saying cognitive law is the only set of laws simultaneously applying both divine law and natural law. So it's the only law that is applying both of those together, blending those together. All other lesser laws derived from cognitive law are subject to natural law and cognitive law. So the laws of nature and the laws of mind. Positive law is, after all, the combination of the laws of nature and the laws of mind. That was a weakness, I have to say, in hindsight, even though there's tremendous definitions, and those definitions don't change, but there was a weakness in simply saying that, sorry, that positive law was merely based on natural law. It's not. It's based on the fact that we are human, well, we say human, we are homo sapiens. We are sentient beings. And so our minds play a critical part in determining the law. Now, another key understanding here, and this is extremely important, why the present system is obsessed in mind control. Because here is a definition 
that breaks it open. As cognitive law is by definition supernatural, certain cognitive law may temporarily suspend or change a natural law under certain conditions. And I'm going to show you examples of this. However, it is not possible for a cognitive law to abrogate, suspend or change a divine law. Let me give you a practical example of that right now. Your uh, cortex, the largest part of your brain, the neocortex, the, the two hemispheres, principally is for the processing of sensory information. And primarily, the largest part of your brain is there to process the visual input of your eyes. Now, in, in nature, as in the digital world, the processing of visual information is an absolute killer of data. It, it is a huge crunch of data. And, and just as you are buying bigger computers or you're buying new equipment to be able to store video or play video, and you can see that you're now talking in terms of gigabytes without even blinking, the same applies to our brain. Our eyes and the processing of visual information is a huge tax on the computational um, abilities of, of the brain. But your brain also needs that information area in order to process previous memory. Now, previous memory, we'll get to in a moment, is stored memory in neurons, and we'll get to how, how neurons actually store it and, and uh, reply, uh, in, input and extract. But your brain still also needs to recall information in a conscious state in order to continue. As I'm speaking with you, I've got to remember what I'm about to say. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. Uh, and I've also got to remember the, the thoughts that I want to share with you. So as my eyes are open, my brain is having to deal with the visual information, but it's also having to deal with the, the recall information. And this becomes a real estate problem because the brain just doesn't have enough room to do both. So our brain, our mind, creates an artificial theatre because one theatre is already being used. When our eyes are open, the theatre at the back of our brain for the processing of visual information is currently in use. So our brain creates a temporary theatre for the processing of thought. And, in, and as I explained to you, I believe, uh, with more information, with more detail, it proves the supernatural, the above natural aspect of the mind because there is nothing there. It's a ghost. And it's this. The brain uses an excellent piece of smooth skin approximating the size of the back of the skull as its temporary theatre. And it produces a chemical cloud approximating the volume of the audiovisual cortex area of the brain in front of that temporary movie theater so that the brain, but more importantly, so that the mind, I should say, the mind convinces itself that it has a second area, it has a second movie theater operating. Now, if you think about it, where is that second screen? when your eyes are open? Yes, it is your forehead. And what is that chemical cloud, that chemical film? Yes, it's the chemical accretion that occurs on the forehead through the hypothalamus, the projector. So we have evidence, albeit evidence that for all the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of psychologists and cognitive scientists out there, their study being a study of behavior, a study of mind control, have not given an adequate philosophical answer to this. There is certainly evidence to suggest that the ghost in the machine is alive and well in the mind tricking itself, that the brain is operating outside of the mind and the brain is operating outside of itself. 
in the projection of the thought theatre and the projection of thought. Well, that's supernatural. Okay. Well, let's move forward then. <clears throat> We're talking about mind, an area that psychology avoids in its official design, avoids. It talks about it, but it talks about it always back in the safety of behaviour, of accumulative data, so that it can argue behaviour modification, which is really what it's about, mind control. But what is mind? So let me come through a couple of definitions of what we mean by mind. Mind is a term used to define the location, function and collection of all consciousness, thoughts, dreams, memory, volitions, identity, intellect, perception, emotions and expression of a higher order being as distinct from the physical and biological processes of its body. Okay, so it's a long list of words, but it's a collection of things. It's a collection of consciousness, it's a collection of attributes, it's a collection of skills, it's a collection of awareness, of unique awareness. And interestingly, the word mind originates from the Holy Irish, the Gaelic, muin or muind, meaning educate, instruct and teach. Well, okay, we'll get into mind, we'll get into consciousness in a moment. What's another word that they use to describe us? Being is another word. So what do we mean by being? Let me read out a definition that we're working on for the canons on this. Being, also known as essence, is a term used to define both the physical manifestation of a living higher order organism, as well as the existence of a mind and self in a present moment of time space. Okay, so being is a term to define the, the manifestation. And, and where does the word being come from? Well, it comes again, believe it or not, from the Holy Irish and the Gaelic, again, the root bio, meaning alive, live, living and animate, and the suffix uh, ing, meaning action of, result of, product of, material of. So it's the product of living. It's the result of living. It's the material of living which is wholly consistent. Now, I mentioned consciousness. The consciousness is a, is a crucial understanding of mind. And what do we mean by consciousness? Well, the definition that we've used for consciousness, because it is this very uh, mercurial area when you go and look at actually what they mean by it, but we define consciousness as this. Consciousness is a term used to define a class of attributes of the mind, exhibited primarily through a lucid, awake and aware state as opposed to a sleeping, daydreaming, subconscious or unconscious state. The term is also used to define the state of wakefulness itself as being conscious and consciousness. So consciousness is, is a series of qualities. It's a series of attributes of the mind. It isn't the mind itself. It's not the whole mind. It's a class of attributes of the mind. And really, consciousness is as much determined by distinguishing it from other things like the subconscious and unconscious, which are also parts of the mind. So this gives us a clue. Well, let's look at the attributes of consciousness and then let's look at this division between consciousness, the subconscious and the unconscious. So when we look at the attributes, we say this, excluding wakefulness, which is also a state of being, there are eight attributes of mind classed as fundamental to consciousness, including self, lucidity, sensory, locational, momentary, contextual, situational, and hypothetical. So let's go through those just briefly. Self-awareness is awareness of one's own unique existence as a whole as distinct from other life forms. Self. Lucidity awareness is awareness of one's own thought as it has emerged just prior or during its expression. The famous expression, expression that people uh, hear from Descartes, which is actually wrongly quoted, which is, I think, therefore I am, it was actually, I, I, I doubt, 
um, therefore, and then it went 